This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 16th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss our first take on what the strike on Saudi's oil facilities means to Alaska. Second, we discuss what Ed King's latest piece on the PFD is telling us about the state's fiscal road ahead. And third, as federal fiscal year 2019 comes to an end, it becomes clear that the Trump administration's deficits are now on track to surpass even the Obama administration's. And now, let's join Michael. Let's start out with the big elephant in the room over the weekend, and that, of course, was the Houthi Iranian terrorist strikes against Saudi Arabia, and what does it mean for Alaska so far and into the future? Well, Michael, I think it I think it indicates um, I, I I think what we've seen so far is that is that the surplus of oil that's been built up largely as a result of the shale sensation in the lower 48 uh, is so huge, it sort of swamps everything, even uh, an attack like this on on the processing center that handles 5% uh, of the world's uh, oil supply. When you look at the futures market, the oil futures market, which is where I and almost everybody else that follows this stuff ran to immediately, uh, when the attacks were announced, um, when you look at the futures market, they're up, uh, but they're up from very lows, uh, which at the end of the day uh, means that they're not up very much from what, for example, Alaska expected at the time we, we did our budget. Uh, the, the current price, the current November price, futures price for oil, I'm looking at it right here in front of me, is, is around $69 now. Now, it was up a little bit over 70 when markets opened yesterday after the attack, uh, or Sunday after the attack, Sunday late, Sunday after the attack, uh, but now it's settled back down, down to the $69 uh, range. To put that in context, uh, the Alaska budget, the current Alaska budget, uh, is built on an oil forecast of $66, um, $66 Alaska, which is roughly the same as as the Brent price. The the what we'd been running before uh, the attack were price levels that were down in the $64 range, $62 range, even down into the $50, $59 range um, for, for several weeks uh, uh, in front of the attack. Uh, and now with the attack, we've bounced back up to $69. If you, if you average that out over time, we may be getting closer to the $66 average. We were running below the $66 that were that's that's this basis for the for the current uh, current budget, uh, but we may be getting back up to the uh, to the $66 range. But when you look out in the futures market, and this is this is another important function of the futures market. It only it not only tells you what the current value. Uh, what people are saying the current value of, of, or what the markets are saying the current value of oil is, but when you, it also gives you a futures strip that you can look at. And when you look beyond uh, November, the futures market uh, starts going, the Brent futures market starts going down. December's right now is $67, January $66, February $65, March 64, May 63, June 62, and we ultimately get down to, by February of 2021, 
uh, the, the forward market for February 2021 is now in the $59 range again. So what the markets are telling us is that there's a concern currently, um, a, a price concern currently, but but the markets are discounting the effect of the concern uh, over time. And as I said, by the end of this fiscal year, the markets are back down. The Brent Currently, the Brent price for June 2020 is back down to, to $63. I think it means that I think so. I think what this means is if nothing else happens and, and you know, there could be another strike which would spike the price again. Uh, if there was an expectation that this was going to be an ongoing problem, it would have it would have a, 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 a higher market reaction. If there was an expectation that was going to lead to war with Iran, for example, a war in the Middle East, uh, it would have a huge a huge impact on the market. But right now, the market is saying that it's a blip, uh, but the market is going to settle back down toward uh, toward price levels that are frankly lower uh, than uh, than we than we base the budget on. One observer over the weekend I thought had uh, had a great uh, commentary on this. He said uh, uh, it was up from the Wall Street Journal, and Greg said uh, effect of the uh, of the of the spike, the price spike, the of the attack is to spike the markets all the way back to where they were in May. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Well, and this is all the combinations that you know people uh, can get a kind of a grip on this and understand. This is all in conjunction with what's going on with the fact that we have this massive, massive uh, supply uh, of, uh, of oil right now. I mean, due to additional, expo uh, uh, additional exploration, uh, American, more kind of American oil independence, the shale explosion. I mean, we've got oil pretty much everywhere right now. Saudi has been struggling trying to... They couldn't even drive the price up by bogarting their own supply and telling all the OPEC nations to reduce their output, They, which they used to be. I mean, if they snapped their fingers, it used to be oil did exactly what they wanted on the pricing market. And now they've been struggling even before this attack. So, I mean, it's a whole new ball game. It is. And and the news, one, one of the... One of the commentators on 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 our blog page. One of the commentators said, "Now I'm confused. I mean, the you you you've been you've been posting all these articles about about oil price being uh, soft and, and and potential declines, and now all of a sudden we have the attack, and you're posting prices about oil prices uh, uh, firming. The reconciliation of that is we have we do have a huge supply overhang. Uh, Saudi prior to the strike." Uh, Saudi and the, the news had been that Saudi and others were talking about ratcheting down production even further to try to just support current price levels, which were in the were in the 60s. Not not try to pressure price back up, but just to support current price levels because the the supply overhang uh, had become uh, had become so significant. What what the what the attack does is for for a for a moment sort of firms the market back up. A concern about you know about about the, the 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 loss of production in Saudi, um, but but it's just it's just for the moment. I mean, what what happened immediately after the attack, or very shortly after the attack, was Saudi said we have a lot of surplus supplies. We'll bring some of those to 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 uh, to the market. President Trump said that he would that he was prepared to open up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is America's reserve supply. Uh, held in caverns down in Louisiana and uh, and elsewhere, um, and 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 the market reacted to that and said, well, it's one attack. Uh, it's going to knock off uh, a portion of Saudi supply for a period of time. The Saudis said they're going to be able to 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 work around it and repair it within a given period of time. We see some concern for this period of time, but then when you look out at the futures uh, over the over the intervene over the following months. Uh, the market saying uh, we just don't see this having a having a long term effect, and for Alaska, I think that means we we may get back we may get back to the the price that uh, that was projected uh, on which the current budget is founded about sixty six dollars. We may get back to that, and that may hold if nothing else happens. That may that we may we may average out that for the year. But this is not going to result in a ton of new revenues, certainly a ton of new, re new revenues over uh, the revenues projected at the time we did the, the spring budget. Remember, Ip's comment was, 
the, the price spiked all the way back to May. Well, that's the time that the spring <laughs> forecast comes out. <laughs> right. So, so right. we just got back, we got back to where we were. We sort of, we sort of, we sort of got back all of the losses that we'd had uh, or all of the price reductions that had gone on in the intervening period. But even that, if you look at the futures market, doesn't look like it's going to hold uh, hold very long. It reinforces the fact that, again, uh, no more of that $150 a barrel high cotton season anywhere in the near future with the shale and the overhang and everything else just not in the cards for the future. So don't don't plan on this bolstering the uh, the coffers of the state of Alaska. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and, you know, one person asked, what would it take then? What would it take for price to move north and, and move significantly north and, and permanently? And it would take, I mean, if people want to be watching out for this, it would take renewed strikes, more than one strike on Saudi, uh, on, on key points, not just, you know, missiles landing in the desert someplace, but on, on key production points. Um, and frankly, it would probably take things that you don't want, uh, like right. war with, like war with Iran, uh, to, uh, to, to move the price significantly north. Yeah. No, the closure of the Straits of Hormuz, it's more attacks on oil tankers, some kind of disastrous strike that causes an oil disaster in the Strait. I mean, there's, you can, you can game this out, but it's all bad, whatever it is, it would all be bad. And it may be good for Alaska in the short term, but it would definitely be bad for the rest of the world in the long term. Well, and what it would cause, I mean, I mean, economists actually quickly went to their to, to their models and and a spike in price would have an effect of slowing the the global economy even more which would have a depressing effect on on demand so you're exactly right it would be good be good in the in the short term for Alaska in the sense of oil prices spiking but over the long term there's significant doubt that it would that would it would uh, play out uh, to have a long term benefit to the state so it's i it, it's a testament i mean Really, you know, in the in the in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties and the two thousands and even earlier in the two thousand tens, strikes in the state of, in the in the Strait of Hormuz, strikes against oil uh, significant oil uh, uh, Saudi oil production centers, that would have sent price just skyrocketing. Right. But it's a significant testimony to to the amount of the, that the oil market has changed as a result largely of lower forty eight shale. Uh, and the amount of uh, production that uh, that America has brought on uh, as a result of that. Let's move on to number two. I want to talk a little bit about Ed King's uh, PFD article, which I think is important, but I think we need to preface this now with a discussion on the departure of Donna Arduin, um, which, again, I cannot, I, I don't think I can overstate how frustrated I am over this watching this. Uh, and all the back chatter that I'm getting, and uh, of course the article in the ADN, which kind of alludes to the same thing. It kind of confirms everything that I had uh, coming up on the other side, which basically is, hey, uh, this was a coup inside that will not a coup, but a, a tussle inside the administration, and it is uh, it's showing us that they are tacking back towards business as usual. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a fair observation. Um, the, the 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 piece or the the thing that got my attention in that regard was in must read Alaska which I don't read often I don't must read it often uh, but when there's something significant going on in the administration I'll go read must read Alaska because it tends to be the the uh, house organ for the or the house publication for uh, what the administration's thinking um, and I and they had posted an article in fact they were the first I think to 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 post an article on uh, uh, her uh, arguments uh, departure, and and a paragraph in that or in that piece by um, uh, by Mustard Alaska really caught my attention. It said, it, "Quote: Her hiring last December was a sign that Dunleavy was serious about budget cuts. Her departure signals that the Dunleavy administration is tacking to the middle, and that future budget cuts will not be as draconian." dash dash if there are cuts at all yep and that um i think that captures uh, it cut especially coming from must read which has been sort of the the as i say the house the house uh, mouthpiece for the administration that coming from must read uh, is is of a, of a lot of concern i mean it it leads you to believe that the dunleavy administration is shifting uh its focus from 
budget cuts, resolving the, the state's fiscal situation through budget cuts to something else. Um, uh, and, and that something else can only be uh, revenues. I mean, we continue to have we continue to have deficits. We're not going to resolve the deficits through budget cuts. We're going to have to resolve it through revenues or draining or draining savings down for a couple of more years, draining the ERA down. Um, and and that's that's a huge concern. That's a that's a big change. The thing that the thing that you and I were talking about before before we started the the before we started today was uh, it may be a little bit premature to get too depressed yet. We haven't heard from the governor, uh, and I think this is something the governor needs to speak on. Uh, this is a significant change in his administration, significant change in the lineup he's had in the administration, significant change in the person who took point um, uh, in the in the in the person who took point on on budget matters before the legislature and in the public. Um, I think the governor needs to speak on what that means to uh, to the administration. I know. Ben yesterday in the press conference and Matt uh, subsequently have all said, "Well, this doesn't mean any significant change in the administration." I don't, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you can say that. Right. Uh, and maybe the governor can explain it, but the governor, I think, needs to speak out on this. It's all spin at this point, uh, as far as I'm concerned. It, it just, it has that feel, and uh, I'm, I'm concerned. I, I'm in total agreement with you. I don't think you could say, "Oh, this doesn't signal any change." Uh, I think we call that back where I come from. I'll be honest with you, when I saw this and I read this, I just, I felt, I felt horrible for Donna in the fact that she took a job that's obviously a thankless job to begin with. She's pretty thick-skinned for is what my impression is of her, so I don't know. I mean, she's a pretty tough cookie. But, you know, to take all this heat and then to kind of be thrown under the bus and i mean you know it's this is not like a blatant i pushed her right in front of it but this is kind of like you nudged her in front of the oncoming train a little bit um to say we're we're, we're done with you kind of thing after taking all this abuse especially um you know from the legislature and some of the commentary that we kept getting from here i just i i really am very frustrated by this whole situation yeah it's um it, it, it was handled oddly i mean it was she was on she was on uh, personal a personal break she was out of state uh you get the impression that she may have had a phone call that morning right uh telling her that you have two weeks notice that we're making a change uh, and then ben doing the, the the public uh the public statement uh that uh, she may have a, she may have a job if she wants to or may have a continuing consulting contract if she wants to at a, at a lowered rate i mean it was just it was it was fairly abrupt and fairly uh uh unpersonal uh it looks uh, very way... op- looks very opportunistic oh she's out of town let's kick her to the curb yeah i i will the other thing that i find that i find interesting and i and i'm not sure i know exactly how to read this yet but but in james brooks's article in the anchorage daily news there's no closing of ranks i mean there's no yeah, the Republicans are all on the same page, and we're all gonna—we've all got the message, and we're all gonna sort of, you know, parrot the parrot the same theme. There was a definite—you can pick up a definite division uh, among the people that that James interviewed between Natasha on on the one hand, uh, and uh, and Mia Casello on the on the other hand. Uh, you can see a definite difference in in how the in how the legislators are reacting right. to this, and I, and 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 so. I mean, that's another indication it was done hurriedly, that that they didn't get out and sort of get a theme that everybody was was on board with, um, and it's another indication of concern. I mean, the fact that Natasha is sort of happy about this and Mia's concerned, uh, I think uh, leads you to leads leads a reader to to be concerned, a reader that's con- that 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 believes that we ought to continue to cut uh, cut government spending. Uh, leads a reader to, to be concerned as well. Yeah, well, normally in these kind of situations, in these kind of articles, you would have, uh, you know, a comment from the Republican side and a comment from the Democratic side. But you'll know that they are most noticeably absent from this article. It is, in fact, the two factions in the Republican Party who are being quoted in this, the spend as usual and the support the cut side. Um, and I think it, again, just reinforces what we've talked about on the program before, we have got to change the players out in what's going on down there because the Republicans, as I said in my opening monologue this morning, uh, are part of the problem, if not 
the lion's share of the problem in the state of Alaska, and quite honestly, nationally at this point. Well, I don't, I don't mean to send you back into depression, but, but we did change out the players. <laughs> well, we, we, yeah. we, we elected a new governor. We elected a governor who, who talked about preserving the PFD and talked about uh, making, making budget cuts. We did have that change. Uh, and now we're, 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 we're seeming seemingly a year, not even a year in. I mean, we got to remember that, that, that the governor was only elected last November, was only uh, 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 sworn in last December, that only had his first budget last February, really. Uh, we're not even a year in, uh, and seemingly we're making, uh, we're making significant change. The, the paragraph that, uh, that, or the paragraphs in James Brooks' article that, that caught my attention, similar to the one uh, in Must Read, uh, is, is quoting Costello, uh, who said she and other lawmakers? This is this is James writing, but but uh, uh, referring to his conversation with Costello, she and other lawmakers believe Arguin's departure is a result of friction between two groups in the governor's office. Costello said the first group is the Tuckerman Babcock faction, referring to the governor's original chief of staff, and the second is the Ben Stevens faction, referring to the governor's current chief of staff, um, and and that those two groups are 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 different and they ha and they mean different things. That's why that's why I think the governor needs to address this. I mean, right. you you get you get Senator Costello out there saying that we have two groups and we've had a change from one group to to the other group. What does that mean, governor? What what Right. Wh exactly. Wh what does it mean for us? Where where are we going? And don't give me don't give me the leader of one of the groups to explain it and don't give me your press aide to explain it. You explain give me, it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you governor, you need to, you, Mike. You need to step out there and tell us what 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 the significance of this. Well, is. we changed some players, Brad, but we didn't change enough. If we had changed just three or four more, we may have had a majority. We may have had a different situation, but I guess at this point, we won't know. We got to jump. Here we go, the Michael Duke Show. <laughs> All right, welcome back. Brad Keithley continues with us here as our guest. We're in our weekly top three. We just started on number two, which we were talking about the departure of Donna Arduin and the ramifications of that, and we move on uh, in part to the second part of number two, which is the article by Ed King talking about the future uh, of the PFD and you know what a changing PFD would look like. Brad, uh, give us some details here. Well, uh, I think you've done a wonderful transition here. I mean, what does is, what is Arduin's departure mean for the PFD? I mean, it's, it, there's two significant questions to ask uh, what's going on here. One, what does it mean for budget cuts? And if it means that we're going we're gonna to stop having budget cuts or we're going to limit budget cuts, as the must-read article indicates, uh, what does that mean then for the PFD, which has been the revenue source that we've been relying on the last now four years? To close the budget gap, uh, uh, when we've had this, when we've, when we've had the difference between uh, spending levels and and revenue levels, Ed King's been uh, uh, writing a series of articles on the PFD. For those who don't follow uh, his blog, uh, if you're interested in the PFD, you should. The last three or four weeks have been devoted to. Uh, he writes a column every Monday morning. Um, and uh, the last three or four weeks have been devoted to the PFD. This is the next to last uh, of the series and really takes a deep dive uh, into the significance of various options uh, for dealing with the PFD. The, the, the entire series has been around uh, uh, various options for how you deal with the PFD, including preserving the existing PFD, but also various options for otherwise uh, modifying the PFD. And this one is a deep dive into the into the into what the um, uh, what the economic significance is or the, the budgetary significance is of, of various options. It really boils down. I mean, it's a very long, very good, very detailed, very, very chart oriented uh, article for those who love spreadsheets and charts and graphs. It's a it's a it's a great dive into it. Uh, but it really boils down to two things. One is uh, funding government by cutting the PFD uh, is bad for Alaskans overall because it means that only Alaskans uh, fund government. 
uh, compared to a broad-based tax, what he refers to as a broad-based tax, uh, uh, a broad-based tax would reach non-Alaskans. It would have non-Alaskans, outsiders contribute a portion to government. A sales tax would have tourists, uh, those who come into the state and buy goods, contribute to, to government. Uh, an income tax or an income-based tax uh, would have uh, non-resident workers uh, contribute, contributing to government. And those are not insignificant percentages. Governor Hammond used to talk about it being 10%, uh, that 10% of revenues would come from non-residents if you, if you used a broad-based tax. ICER's analysis uh, was slightly different than that, depending upon the tax. Uh, it was 7 to 10%. Uh, would come from non-residents, but it's not it's not insignificant. It means it means if you have to raise ten dollars, just to use a number, ten dollars of new revenue, uh, it means a dollar of that. If it's ten percent, a dollar of that would 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 come from non-residents. Only nine dollars would have to come from Alaska residents. If, on the other hand, you use the PFD to cut it, all nine all ten dollars. Are going to come from Alaska residents. Alaska is going to have to cough up more, a dollar more from its economy, uh, from its own economy, internal economy, than it would if if you have a broad-based tax that that captures money from non-residents. So, one conclusion that that Ed draws is that uh, uh, that that using PFDs to using PFD revenues, cutting PFD revenues to fund government is bad for for Alaska overall because it takes more money out of the Alaska economy, shifts more money out of the Alaska economy uh, into the private side of the economy, into the government, than would be the case uh, if we had a broad-based tax. The second, the second conclusion really that you can draw from Ed's analysis is that, that those who oppose broad-based taxes uh, are those who might have to pay them. And so you find as we've talked about on the show before, you find the top 20% really being the ones who are most concerned about broad taxes because they would pay a significantly higher share of the um, uh, of, of the tax than they are currently under PFD. PFD cuts the top 20% pay almost a triple share of their income toward, toward government. Most of burden shifts to middle and lower income Alaska families uh, with a broad base tax, uh, a flat tax or a progressive income tax, or even a sales tax, a, a, a larger share of the burden uh, would shift uh, to the top 20%. So, so the second conclusion is, the, the first conclusion is if you're concerned about Alaska overall, you don't want to use PFD cuts because that takes more out of the Alaska private side economy than a broad-based tax. But if you're, but but the second conclusion is, if you're more concerned about your own personal situation than you are about Alaska overall, uh, and you're in the top 20%, then you should be con you should be concerned about the move to broad-based taxes, and you should you should support PFD cuts. Again, I'm 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 compressing down a long piece with a lot of analysis and a lot of various ways of uh, of looking at the issues uh, that Ed's had over his series of articles and and has in the current article. But that's that's sort of the two conclusions. PFD tax, if, if you're at the Alaska private economy, uh, using PFDs to close bad, uh, good only if you're in the top 20% and you're otherwise concerned about what's going to happen if we go to broad-based taxes. Well, Christine in the chat room says, no, I don't want to pay any taxes. To that, I have to say, you already are. You're paying a tax. They've been taking your PFD for three years, going on four years now. So it is what it is. You're going to pay it one way or the other. There's just there's not much not much you can do about it at this point. Yeah, that's one of the ways. That's one of the ways. Frankly, the top twenty percent has spun this in a way that that has that has sort of covered what's going on here. I mean, they've said, "Oh, taxes bad," uh, and so we all oppose taxes, right? We don't want to have any of those nasty broad-based taxes. We're an anti-tax state. And then the subtext underneath that is, but we're going to cut your PFD, which in effect is an economic tax. It's taking money out of the private sector and putting it into government. That's the classic definition of, of, of an economic tax. Uh, and the subtext is, yeah, yeah, but, but we're, going to, we're going to do this, this PFD tax, uh, but we're not going to call it a tax. So we can continue to say tax is bad. Uh, uh, PFD cuts okay, right? Um, and, but they're all taxes. It's all taxes. It just depends. Uh, it, 
we've fallen into this or some have fallen into this approach of of calling PFD cuts something other than taxes so they they don't fall into that bad that bad category but economically speaking they're all taxes they are all taking in one way or another they're all taking money diverting money out of the private sector into government that is the classic economic definition of a tax um, and 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 with that uh, it's a question of which taxes which tax has 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 the the least adverse effect? The question should be which tax has the least adverse effect on Alaska and Alaskans overall? The top 20% has really turned this into which form of tax has the least impact on us? On the top 20%, we don't really care about Alaska overall or about the remaining 80%. Which which form of taxation has the least impact on us? And they and they pick up allies uh, from from uh, from the remaining eighty percent by saying it's a tax. You don't want you don't want tax. Right. You don't want that. You don't want that at all. Brad Keithley's our guest. Alaska's for sustainable budget. Brad, we're down to the last ninety seconds here. I've posted the link to the Ed King article in the chat room. Can you give us a little thumbnail of what your number three was on the national level? Yeah, number three is is we're going over the edge of the fiscal cliff uh, nationally. Um, Obama was bad. Obama ran up uh, uh, the, what was then the record uh, level of deficits uh, in 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 the nation's history. What people are not focusing on is Trump is worse. We're running up higher level of deficits, and I've got I've got a graph that explains this on on the on our website or on our uh, Facebook page. Uh, we're running up higher levels of deficits, deeper deficits under the Trump administration than we did even under the Obama administration. If you were concerned about deficits under Obama, you really need to be concerned about deficits under Trump. This is what I was saying at the very beginning of the uh, uh, of the, of the show, Brad, that, that this, is this, this is the problem that we're facing. Oh, vote for me. I'm, a, I'm an R. I got the elephant right here. See it? Trust me. We'll, we'll be the fiscal conservatives that you want to be. Yet you look at the track record over the last 20 years, uh, in the uh, in the nation and in the state, and you'll see that they're the ones. Uh, aside from all their rhetoric, they're the ones that have continued to drive the bus, you know, over the fiscal cliff with with abandon. Like they just mash their foot on the accelerator, and they've got no other, you know, no other option. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. And the and the and the Trump the 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 figures that are coming out of the Trump administration now that we see what their budget approach has been the last couple of years, and we see what the projections are uh, with uh, with the the the, the revenue uh, measures that they've signed over the last couple of years, they're staggering. I mean, the deficit. One way to to look at the deficit, national deficit, is as a percent of GDP. How much of our gross domestic product? Are uh, is are are we running fueling through through deficits? The Obama administration started high. Uh, it started in the middle of the Great Recession. It started high. Uh, it was eight percent uh, of GDP, which is a staggeringly high number uh, in the first couple of years of the Obama administration. But by the end of the Obama administration, it was low. We, we were down in the in the two range uh, and the three range in terms of percent of of. Uh, of uh, the deficit as a percent of GDP, and the median over the knocking out the outliers, the median over the over the Obama administration was 3.73 percent. Not great, but not horrible. Well, you look at the Trump administration. You look at the first two years, and then the projections of of where we're headed under the Trump administration, and they're staggeringly worse. There's no eight percent in there, so there's no single spot, no single year that you can go, oh shit, this is this is bad. But but the continuation of 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 where they're going uh, adds up to much worse than the Obama administration. The Obama the Obama administration had a median uh, uh, percent of of GDP of of deficits percent of GDP of three point seven three percent. The projection for the eight years of the Trump administration, if we go eight years, is four point seven six percent, a full percentage point of GDP, and that's a big number a full percentage point of GDP higher under the Trump administration deficits as a percent of GDP than under the Obama administration. And if you just look at numbers, the Obama administration ran up a deficit, total national increase of national debt, uh, total deficits of $6.5 billion over its eight years. The Trump administration, the current projections for the Trump administration is $9 billion, 50% more 
than in, in terms of deficits than was run up under the Obama administration. So if you are concerned about deficits, if that's what was driving you uh, during the Obama administration, concerned about those deficits during the Obama administration, you need to be even more concerned uh, about where the, the Trump administration is heading us because it's driving us, I mean, 50% more in terms of deficits, a percentage point more in terms of of percent of GDP, that's driving us over the fiscal cliff. We're not we're not hanging over it anymore. That's starting to drive us over it, uh, drive us over it, and putting us into an entirely separate realm uh, about how we're going to have to deal with national debt, uh, national debt going forward, and an entirely separate realm about the impact that we're having on future generations as a result of what this generation is doing in terms of fiscal policy. Well, we need to be having this conversation. And the problem is, of course, anytime you start criticizing what's happening with the pre- – oh, what, don't you support the president? Don't you do – he's a republic. Did you want Hillary? No, that's not what we're saying. But you've got to call a spade a spade. You can't just say, hey, uh, this is all great because our guy's in office. You can't continue these kind of policies – and have everything survive. Yeah, it's, I mean, James Mattis last week, former Secretary of, uh, of, of Defense, James Mattis, highly respected James Mattis, was asked on, uh, on, on one of the Face the Nation, I think it was, one of the Sunday morning news programs last week, tell us what, what the biggest national security threats are today. And Mattis broke it into uh, external threats and internal threats. And the biggest internal threat, the first thing he mentioned, when he talked about when he talked about internal threats, was the was the national the national debt. Uh, internally, I would look at the. Uh, he said internally, I would I would I would look at at uh, these two. It's our and the first is is he said this. It's our growing debt that we're going to transfer to the younger generation with seeming no fiscal discipline. That's to to James Mattis, Secretary of Defense. That's one of the biggest. Uh, national security, biggest threats to national security that the U.S. is is facing. And it, it was. I mean, it was a big concern during the Obama administration, led to the Tea Party, led to the reaction that, that frankly, got the Obama administration uh, under under control in the, in the second term. Um, but it's now bigger. I mean, I, I, I want to emphasize that word. It's bigger uh, under the Trump administration. The, 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 uh, the debt the debt to gross domestic product, the level of debt uh, uh, nominally, just the, the gross number, uh, are both bigger under the Trump administration, and they are they have become a, a concern of, of, of national security. You're, we're not going to be able to fund national defense at the levels that, that some think we should going forward because we won't have the revenues. We'll have to we'll have limitations on on how much debt we can run to do that sort of thing. We won't. We're going to have to cut Medicare. Uh, Social Security uh, and Medicaid uh, in order to uh, in order to deal uh, with the debt. We won't be making the investments in technology that have that have led to the the quality of life we have now. We're going to increase the tax burden uh, on on future generations, make future generations pay not only what they what they need for their government, but to pay off what. Uh, what this government, this generation has run up. There's all sorts of bad consequences of this, right. uh, and we're just we're we're getting deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Well, maybe we can pull the wool back machine. I don't know if we can if we can uh, stop the inexorable slide to the edge, but uh, we'll keep uh, we'll keep banging that drum. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on board today. We really appreciate it, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.